Well, good morning. I want to start this morning by reviewing our vision. We'll spend just a few moments doing so, so we can jump into the message so that we will end on time. The vision is on the screen, but you can also find it on the front of your worship bulletins this morning. So let's all say this together. Okay, let's do this once. The vision is to glorify God by being a vibrant church driven by a passion for God's word, God's family, and God's world that reproduces vibrant churches locally and globally. Good. Again, we don't expect uh, any of you to memorize this overnight, as we know it's a long sentence, uh, but there are three distinctives uh, to better help us uh, to, uh, to really memorize and focus on God's word, God's family, and God's word world, and that is biblical, intergenerational, and missional. Here at Walnut, we want to be biblical. That means we want to be driven by a passion for God's word. We want to be intergenerational, which means we're not a young church, we're not an old church, we're a church for everyone, for people of every age, race, or culture, and we want to be driven by a passion for God's family as laid out in the scriptures. And not only that, but we want to be missional, which means We are big on missions, but missions is not just going on mission trips or supporting missionaries internationally. It's more than even local missions. It's both locally and globally. That each and every follower of Jesus Christ has been given Jesus' mission. Missionaries, uh, that we are missionaries to our schools, to our communities, and to our workplaces. So in our lives, we want to be driven by a passion for God's world, and this ultimately impacts our stewardship in our daily uh, living. <clears throat> we also have a catchphrase that we want to be deep and wide, which means we want to be deep in God's word, deep in discipleship, deep in genuine relationships in the church, but we want to be wide in our outreach, wide in our diversity, and, and wide in terms of our impact locally and globally. So as the weeks go along, we'll continue to unpack this uh, but today I want to jump right into the message. I want to jump right into the message so that we don't go too much over time. We're continuing our study from the book of Acts. And again, we're studying Acts because the book of Acts highlights for us and teaches us of the beginning of the early church. And no one would disagree that if you want to look at an example of a vibrant church, a church that is healthy, strong, and moving, then you look at the church of Jesus Christ as laid out, as it is empowered by the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, we saw that Jesus, he gave his disciples the mission to spread the gospel, to proclaim Christ in the power of the Spirit everywhere, locally and globally, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But he told them to wait. Don't go yet. You have the Great Commission, and you have a more specific mission to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, but don't go yet. You need to wait. Wait for the right empowering. Wait for the right equipping. And so in Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascended into heaven, uh, but he did not leave his followers alone. The disciples would be indwelt and empowered by the Spirit of God. And if you have Christ in your life, then you also have this same power. You have the power of the person of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And that's where we find ourselves today. Uh, We find ourselves in Acts chapter 2, where the church began. So if you have God's word, will you please take it and turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And the title of our message this morning is Jesus' vibrant church is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus' vibrant church is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now there are three narrative points that we're going to highlight today. This is a narrative, so we're going to look at three narrative points, and then we will unfold meaning as we go along. The first point on your outlines is the setting. We just want to see the setting. There's some significance to the day of Pentecost. And we see this setting highlighted in verse 1 and verse 5. It's very important and significant theologically that the church was born specifically on the day of Pentecost. Notice in verse 1, it says this, that when the day of Pentecost arrived, they, and the day there is referring to 120 Christ followers, 
were all together in one place. And we know that they were in Jerusalem. Okay, they were in Jerusalem. Now, Acts 1, verse 15, tells us that there were 120 of Jesus' followers gathered in Jerusalem. And they were gathered in Jerusalem to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. But what is the day of Pentecost? First, Pentecost is a Jewish festival that was celebrated 50, 50 days after Passover. The word penta simply means five. And Pentecost means 50th. So Pentecost refers to another Jewish festival that took place 50 days after the Jewish Passover. Jews from all over the Diaspora, Jews from all over the region would gather in Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, to celebrate the grain harvest. And this would be early summer right after the grain harvest. Basically after the harvest, to give thanks for God and His providence, they would bring an offering before the Lord to give thanks for the first fruits, the first fruits of the grain harvest. And so in Exodus 23, which is on the screen, uh, just the reference point, in Exodus 23, verse 16, it refers to this festival as the Feast of the Harvest. <clears throat> in Deuteronomy 16, 9 to 10, it refers to the Jewish Pentecost as the Feast of Weeks. In Numbers 28, verse 26, it refers to this festival as the Day of the First Fruits. In Leviticus 23, verse 16, it explains that during this one-day festival, special grain offerings were made in order to give thanks to God for providing the, the wheat harvest. And they would take the first fruits or the first batch of the wheat or grain and offer it up to God. Why is all this significant? Sorry about my voice. I think I was screaming in uh, Sunday school, so it's a little hoarse a little bit. But... <clears throat> In, uh, and, and I didn't drink water because I have the water of God's word. But um, in, in Exodus 20, uh, the reason why Exodus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and Leviticus is so important is because this idea of first fruits. Right? What is a first fruit? When you have a harvest, you take the first batch and you say, thank you, God, for the harvest. To show our thanks, we're going to show you the first fruits. But there is a spiritual harvest happening that Jesus Christ has a people, a people that would be the church. And that people would represent Believers from every age, every race, every culture, from Jerusalem, from Judea, from Samaria, from the ends of the earth. But these 120 believers would receive the down payment of the Holy Spirit, and they rep would represent the first batch of believers. This is the first fruits of Jesus' work on the cross. Jesus died on the cross to accomplish salvation for a people, his people, the church. And this is the first batch of spiritual fruits. And that's why it's so significant that the, the day of the Jewish Pentecost, where the Jewish people celebrated their first fruits and gave that as an offering to God, here you see the beginning of the church. So it was a significant setting. But there was also a practical implication. Notice verse 5. Verse 5 says that Luke records that Jewish people from all over the Mediterranean world came to this important festival. So it says that there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. So Jewish males were required to attend these festivals, and these Jewish pilgrims made the long journey. <clears throat> so behind me is a picture of, just a general picture of the Jewish diaspora. And you have pilgrims from all over the place. And history tells us that as early as 586 BC, Jews were dispersed throughout the ancient world and, and they were, uh, eventually they were permitted to return home to Jerusalem. Many of these Jewish people chose to stay in their foreign nations. So let me illustrate this for you. Here in this room, we have many children of immigrants. And some of you are immigrants yourselves. Uh, my parents were immigrants. And when my grandparents came here, they knew that English was the functional language of America, but they retained, obviously, the Chinese language and their culture. And my parents learned to function in English or Chinglish. Uh, my dad has good English. He even speaks Spanish. Uh, but, but my mom operates in some English, but she'll speak to me in Chinese. But I 
you speak a little bit of Chinese, but mainly operate in English. And probably my children will not speak Chinese, even though I'll try. But because my, my Chinese is not as good, they'll probably function in English. And that's what happened. You have people who are Jewish in culture, Jewish in ethnicity, but they've been spread out all over the Mediterranean world. And as their children began to populate that region, their children retained the culture and the language of that nation. And for many of you, your children or you yourselves are pretty much culturally American and you speak only English. And maybe you learned Spanish because you took it as a second language in, in, in high school. But that's about it. And, and so that's the same situation here. And so in this sense, Jesus has commanded his disciples. And he says, you are going to bring the gospel to the nations. But how are you going to accomplish that? But here at Pentecost, the nations have been brought to Jerusalem where you have Jewish people who understand the roots of the Christian faith. They understand the history of Israel and their coming Messiah. And now they're going to hear about Jesus. And they're going to hear, even though they're Jewish, they're going to hear in their custom and their culture the gospel. Right? So there is a practical aspect of the church beginning at Pentecost. There is the theological aspect, which is the first fruits of the church, but of Jesus' work, but there is a practical aspect, which is you have a bunch of people with different languages from different cultures, but they're Jewish and they're gathered here. And it says that a hundred, uh, it doesn't say in the Bible, but history tells us that, that Jerusalem, the population swelled from a hundred thousand inhabitants to a, to around a million people during these Pentecost festivals, which would be a great opportunity to share the gospel. And this was the perfect setting for the second truth that we have this morning, which is the arrival of the Spirit. So the first point this morning is the setting. The setting is important because it's Pentecost and it's practical. But the second truth is the arrival, the arrival of the Spirit. And it says that the Spirit arrived a sound like the uh, a mighty rushing wind. And, and I was talking with our brother Ray Tay about worship songs over email, and he suggested Consuming Fire, and I remember that song from college. And I said that would be the perfect song that would match the passage of Scripture because it describes how the Holy Spirit arrived at Pentecost. Notice in verses 2 to 4 that the Holy Spirit comes from heaven. The Holy Spirit comes from heaven, and this happened suddenly. We see verse 2, that the coming of the Spirit is compared to a noise. There's a noise, there's a sound like a mighty, violent, rushing wind. And this gives us imagery that's taken from Ezekiel. From Ezekiel 37, verses 9 to 14, the wind is used to describe God breathing new life into dead bodies. And so you see this idea of people who don't have spiritual life, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they have life that's breathed into, into them, the life of the Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 3, verse 8, in John, the Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus him, himself, he described the event of the Holy Spirit's coming and what it would be like. And the Holy Spirit is being like a wind. A wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In other words, Jesus said in John 8 that being born of the Spirit is like the sudden, invisible sound and movement of the wind. The aspect of wind as imagery is how sudden and unexpected the event is. When wind is powerful, when it moves, you don't know where it came from. You don't know when the wind is going to kick up or when it's going to change directions. But all you see are the effects. You can tell where the wind goes because of what's being blown. You can see the damage if the wind is, is so awesome and great. And it's like that with the Holy Spirit. You don't know when God is going to move through the power of the Spirit. You can't predict it. You can't force it. The Spirit is, can't be controlled or contained. The Spirit will spread where He wants to go and to accomplish God's work. But what you will see are the effects of the Spirit. You will see the fruits of the Holy Spirit working in people's lives. And that's what happened here in Acts 2. Notice also in verse 3. Notice in verse 3 it describes a supernatural scene. Tongues that look like flames of fire 
appeared and settled on each individual believer. Now the tongues here, the tongues here refers to languages. But these tongues, they looked like, they weren't actual physical flames of fire. So, so you don't have dragon breath happening here. Okay, but, but what's happening is that these tongues looked like visible flames of fire. They weren't literally flames of fire. Okay, and, and otherwise, you know, you can get tongues by just eating sriracha. But verse 3 says, tongues that appeared like visible flames of fire came and rested upon every individual. And in the Old Testament, this is Old Testament imagery. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, when God appeared to Moses, it was in fire. It was in a burning bush, revealing himself to Moses through fire. Exodus 3, 2, the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire. So that when the Lord shows up and when the Lord manifests himself, it's in fire. Because fire is vibrant. doesn't mean we're going to set ourselves on fire. Okay, burn the church down. Vibrant church is on fire. That's not what we're going to do. Okay, um, in Exodus 19, verse 18, now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. So notice in verse 4, when it says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, it was like tongues of fire. And, and what happened was they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So as the Spirit of God indwelled each believer, they began to speak what we understand as, as intelligible languages. This is a supernatural manifestation where people who normally don't speak a foreign language, without the help of Rosetta Stone, they're able to speak those languages. Okay, I don't speak Spanish. I wish I did. But if I started to preach the gospel in Spanish, I know there's some of you in here, like Pastor John, and there's others who understand Spanish, and you'll say, yeah, I understand that Hanley's preaching the gospel. And it would be a miracle because I don't speak any Spanish. Right? That's exactly what's happening here. These 120 Christians, most of them from Galilee, and, and they don't speak these foreign languages, but all of a sudden, they're speaking Arabic, Coptic, Parthian, Latin, and other dialects that were represented here on uh, Pentecost, and others, these Jewish pilgrims who are coming from their foreign land, and again, remember, like I explained, they're, cultural, they're Jewish ethnically, but culturally, they speak the language of their native land. They could understand the gospel being proclaimed. They can understand tongues and what's being said. So, thirdly, I want you to see the third point, which is the response of the crowd. You see the, the response of the crowd... The people were amazed. They were amazed because they understood their own native language being spoken for the purpose of evangelism. Look at Acts 2, verse 6. It said, each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Right? In Acts 2, verse 8, we each hear them in our own native language to which we were born. So here's these Jewish people, once again, pilgrims, and they were born into their culture, into their society, and their understanding in their own language. Acts 2, verse 11, we hear them in our own tongues. So what type of tongues are these? These aren't some majestic, you know, some majestic tongue. These are, these are intelligible, actual, foreign languages. And, it, and they were speaking these languages via miracle. Notice verse 6. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and they were bewildered. They were be bewildered, which means confused. Now today, you and I, we don't say when the teacher teaches something or when we don't understand, oh, I'm bewildered. I'm bewildered by that. And we just don't talk that way. But, but if you were to see this scene happen, some of you would be confused. How is it that these people are speaking languages that we understand? They're speaking whatever, you know, I understand English, a little bit of Mandarin, I understand Pig Latin. So, you know, maybe they're, they're preaching the gospel in these languages. And you understand it, right? And so you, you might be confused. You have two groups of people here. You have the believers and the crowd of unbelievers. 120 believers, a crowd of unbelievers. And the response from the unbelievers, hey, this guy's speaking Arabic. That's my native language. This guy's praising God in Latin. That's my native language. You get the picture. And verse 7 says they were amazed. So some were confused. Some were amazed. And verse 7 says they were astounded, saying, look, 
these people who are speaking our languages, aren't they, aren't these all Galileans? Aren't these all Galileans? What do they mean by that? Well, the majority of Jesus' earliest followers from, were from a region around the Sea of Galilee known as Galilee. And Jesus had spent most of his time during his earthly public ministry in the region of Galilee. And so there was this stereotype. It's not an accurate stereotype. But there was a stereotype that Galileans were unsophisticated, uneducated, fishermen type of people. Right? And the truth is that most Galileans were bilingual. And they could speak Aramaic and Greek. And some Galileans were able to speak Hebrew. But still, these Galileans would not be able to speak the dialects represented that day. And this is why in verse 8, the crowds began to respond. How is it? We're amazed. We're astounded. How is it that each of us can hear in our own native language. How is it? Verse 9, it, it tells us these languages. In verse 9, if you look at verse 9 of Acts 2, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, and in Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia. Verse 10, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, which refers to Gentiles. So proselytes are Gentiles who converted to Judaism. Verse 11 says, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them all. We hear them all in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. So what are they speaking of? What is the content of their speech? Very clear. They're speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And no doubt I would believe that they're proclaiming the mighty victory and work of Jesus Christ. And these 120 believers were praising God and the crowd was amazed. Verses 12 to 13, if you'll look with me at verses 12 to 13, further records other responses from the crowd. Some were amazed, some were astounded, some accepted. But others, they, as they com- continued in amazement, some began to mock. In verse 12 it says, And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity. Again, I'm perplexed, I'm confused. right? And others tried to explain the event as a result of drunkenness. So whenever you have the work of God, people are going to respond differently. When God works in your life, some people are going to say, wow, your life has changed. That's amazing. I never thought that Jesus could help you break those habits. I never would imagine that you would change. I want to know about your Jesus. Can you tell me about your Jesus? Yeah, uh, this Jesus changed my life. Come to David Seeker's class and you'll learn more. You know, I mean, you can talk about it, but others will be like, I can't believe you changed, bro. You changed, bro, and it's not good. You changed. You used to party with us. You used to spend your money in a certain way. You used to, you know, it's tax season, right? You used to be not a stickler about, like, cheating on your taxes. But now you're trying to follow the rules and you're trying to report everything? What's wrong with you, bro? Come on, Sunday morning, we could go make a lot of money. But you need to go to church? You know, people are going to, when God works in your life, people are going to respond differently. When we pray for someone and someone gets healed, people are going to say, no way! That's a miracle. It's coincidence. But others will say, that has to be God. That has to be God. So whenever God works in our lives, people are going to respond differently. Some will be will praise you and want to know more about your Jesus. Others are, who are believers will say, yes, God is awesome, and they'll be encouraged. Others will be confused, like, what is going on? And others will mock you, and they'll say, you must be drunk. You must be crazy. So some are saying, and you look at verse 13, but others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. And this is natural, this is the natural response of human beings to God's supernatural work. But what the Holy Spirit is doing here in Acts 2 is that He's providing a symbol, a symbol of the gospel overcoming the barriers of language and location. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, He said, make disciples of all nations. And in Acts 1.8, he further elaborates on that mission and he says, you will be my witnesses. You will receive power in the whole, in the power of the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses. Where, Where do you want us to witness, Jesus? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, this city. You will be my witnesses in Judea, the neighboring city. You will be my witnesses in Samaria, the entire region. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Everywhere. Well, Jesus, there's some problems. One, we don't speak the languages of the ends of the earth. So how do we do this? There's a language barrier. 
But there's a location bearer. I'm here in Jerusalem. How do we get to the ends of the earth? How does the, the gospel move? When we go out there, we don't speak the language. We have location issues. And Jesus said, well, got your problem solved. Here's the internet. No, just kidding. He said, Pentecost. 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 That's his answer. Is that here on the day of Pentecost, you have Jews who at least understand the ground of the gospel, the Old Testament. They, they're a bit taught and they speak these languages. And they're all in one place. So what happened at Pentecost was an act, a sign that Acts 1-8 would indeed be successful. That the gospel would reach people of every age, race, and culture. And here you have it. The barrier of language, gone. Jesus clarifies for them through the power of the Holy Spirit, through tongues. A, a temporary means at that moment to show evangelism, for the purpose of evangelism, to show the power of the Spirit to overcome the barrier of language. But not only that, it overcomes the barrier of location because they're all in one place. And if you look over at Acts chapter 2, verse 41, after Jesus, after Peter preaches the gospel, it records in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, that 3,000, many of these Jewish pilgrims became believers. Some of them, no doubt, would have stayed in Jerusalem to be part of the first church. But many of them, they'd have to go home. And as they went home, back to the ends of the earth, they would bring with them their newfound faith through the power of the Spirit. These new believers, 3,000 of them, many of them would spread out. And they would begin to take part in Jesus' mission. And that's beautiful. So what we have here is a foreshadow of the church spreading across the face of the earth. A foretaste of believers who's, who are being renewed in the image of God and they're worshiping God. Not in one language, not in Greek, not in Hebrew, but they're worshiping God in their very own language. So we see the gospel mission overcoming the barriers of language and location. But there's something bigger happening here. There's something amazing happening in biblical history. You know, in Genesis 1.28, God gave Adam and Eve a mission that was similar to Acts 1.8. It's a little different because there was no sin yet. But God told Adam and Eve, you will be fruitful and you will multiply, meaning reproduce, have children. And the purpose of that is I want you to fill the earth. I want you to spread out. And the idea would be fill the earth, spread out and fill the earth with image bearers of God so that individuals would bring glory to God. So everywhere on the face of the earth, the most glorious aspect of God's creation was the creature of the human race. Man and woman created in the image of God. And as you reproduce these image bearers, they would reflect God's glory so that the entire earth would be filled with worship. Now, that plan was distorted by sin at the fall of man. But God didn't give up. Even though it was kind of, kind of distorted, after God flooded the earth, he gave Noah, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 2, the very same command. I mean, God knew that Noah would not succeed, but God wanted to make it very clear, this is still my intention, and one day it's going to happen. And so God tells Noah the same thing. Noah, you you got a fresh start. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth with my glory. But due to the sinful nature of man, the inevitable happened, and Adam's race failed once again to accomplish God's mission to fill the earth with worshipers in the image of God. By the time you get to Genesis 11, man is so sinful and so wicked. Remember God's plan. Fill the earth. Spread out, spread out, spread out. Because I want worship across the face of the globe. But man is so wicked that they gather in one place so instead of filling the earth, they gather at Babel. And they built this tower, foolish men. I don't know what they were thinking, but they were building this tower. 
And, and the point of this tower was to get to heaven because they rejected God's sovereign reign. They rejected God's sovereign plan of spreading across the face of the earth. And they were thinking, if we could reach heaven, we can overthrow God. And up until this point in history, every single human being spoke the same language. We don't have any record in the Bible leading up to Genesis 11 that people spoke foreign languages. Everyone was able to communicate. But as a punishment, what God does at this one gathering and to accomplish his will, he confuses languages at Babel. And it was at the Tower of Babel that we get all the foreign languages that we have. Because God confused their languages so that they, they can no longer collaborate in rebellion. And so by default, he spread them out. They spread out across the face of the earth. So they didn't want to listen to God. So God says, I'm going to spread you out anyway. But Jesus is not Adam and not Noah. Jesus is a true and better Adam. And his race is composed of people from every tongue, every tribe, every nation, whose we are, we are being renewed in the image of God so that we can worship him in our own language everywhere. So, and that happens because the gospel would reach the ends of the earth. So what you have here in Acts 2 is rather than confusing languages, God clarifies Languages. So the same God who confused languages, he clarifies the language. He's like, at Babel, you guys didn't get it. You guys weren't in rebellion. But now you're gathered here not to rebel against me, to worship me. And I'm going to clarify languages so that my original purpose of the gospel going to the nations could happen in multiple languages. And the church will spread across the face of the earth, Acts 1.8. And in every location, there will be local gatherings. Only these aren't gatherings of rebellion. It's not Babel. These aren't gatherings of rebellions. Instead, in every location, you will have people worshiping Jesus Christ in their native language and culture. And they will be worshiping the true God. And that's missions. John Piper says in his book, he wrote, missions exist because worship doesn't. The fuel of missions is worship. Missions exist because God wants worship. And he wants worship in every tongue, every tribe, every nature, every age, every race, every culture. And Acts 2, you get a foretaste of it. There's no barrier that the gospel cannot overcome. And if you're part of Jesus' people, you're part of Jesus' vibrant church. And so together, all of these little local gatherings of worshipers in their own language, together they are Jesus' vibrant church. So what makes the church vibrant is the power of the Holy Spirit to live out the mission of God. The Spirit empowers the church to overcome the barriers of language and location. That's the central truth of this morning's message. To fill in your blanks, the Spirit empowers the church to overcome the barriers of language and location. Now there are several application points. The first, the first is one that I alluded to earlier. When God works in your life, when He saves you, when He begins to change your life, people will respond to the work of the Spirit differently. Some will persecute you. Some will receive you. But there is no barrier in your heart that God cannot break. So as God begins to break barriers, it's going to be powerful. But you have to be ready for God's work. He will transcend every barrier in your heart and people will look at it differently. Okay. Another aspect of application is that you might think that there are some barriers. I want to extend this beyond language and location. There are some barriers in your heart that you might think God cannot work in your life. Oh, you know, I've had this habit for so long. There's no way I can change. The Holy Spirit, He can overcome the barrier of language and location, but even greater, He can overcome the barrier of your sin, and He has because of Jesus, and He will. Whatever it is, is there a barrier that you feel like there's a barrier between you and your child and you want to evangelize and you're like, I can't. 
You need the power of God. God can overcome that barrier. Is, is, is there sin in your marriage? And you're like, here's this barrier, and it's like we're speaking different languages. God can overcome that barrier, but it's in Jesus Christ. It's in the power of the Holy Spirit. God can overcome the barriers of language and location, and even beyond that, he has overcome the barrier of sin. He will overcome any barrier in your life, and he will empower you to live for him. But when he moves, you've got to be ready. Because when he moves in your life, people are going to respond differently. Some will accept it. Some will curse you. Some will not believe. Second, this passage, um, this passage impacts our church in, in a certain way in the sense that in our church, we have um, some language barriers. They're not really barriers, though, if you think about it. You know, in, in our church, we have three languages, right? Mandarin, Cantonese, um, four languages, right? English. And then there's youth language, which is a different language. You know, it's like the, the text language. You know, I don't <laughs> the text language, the Facebook language, all that lingual. I mean, I, can't, I don't know how you preach a sermon in that, Matt, but, you know, you know Pastor Matt and Eugene have to speak that language. And I, so uh, there's different languages. But you know what unites us? is God. It's God. We have a common relationship. I don't know if you've met some of our brothers and sisters. I mean, if you've been in our church for a while, you know. But some of our Mandarin brothers and sisters, you know, they're some of the warmest people in the world. I don't know if you met them. But some of them, you know, especially the ones who've been around here for a while, and you know they're so warm. I mean, uh, the food is good. Uh, Cannies, brothers and sisters, you know their food is good. Okay, you know their food is good. It's like it's like there's a restaurant in there, right? And uh, But it's more than just food. If you talk to some of them, you'll see their passion for evangelism. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, Pastor Albert, myself, Pastor Jeff, and Pastor Wilson gathered with Rwanda and the two other small group officers. Small group officer from Cantonese, small group officer from Mandarin. And, and it was surprising how we had the same philosophy, same heart, some of the same challenges. We're trying to share materials. And, and, and Rwanda sent me this, you know, I can speak some Mandarin, but I can't read any Chinese. Or maybe like one or two words. Uh, because I was disobedient and didn't care to go to Chinese school. You know, I just didn't pay attention. And and she sent me the Cantonese small group policy. And she's like, can we adopt this? And I said, I can't read it. Uh, and she's like, okay, I'll translate it for you. So she's like working on translating it for me. I read it. I said, yeah, we could, we could uh, you know, these don't apply, but everything else applies. And, and, and we'll use it because they did the work already. It's just in a different language. We have to see that we are one church. We're one church, and we have resources that we can share. And and a lot of people look at differences in language as a challenge. Like, oh my goodness, we have so many languages, it's such a challenge, and you know everything moves so slowly. But you can look at it as a positive that we have resources that other churches might not have. We have ways where if your parents don't speak English, you don't have to take them to another church down the street. If your grandparents don't speak English, you don't have to take them to another church down the street. Right, but that's only possible when we add value to each other. One way that you can stay connected with this church, because we're a big church, big church, lots of people. We love you. Our pastors love you. And we wish that we can get down to a level to know all of you, but it's impossible. And, and so we don't know if you're hurting sometimes unless you tell us. We don't know what's going on in your life unless you submit a prayer request. But one thing that I love is that the, the, the prayer request, it's printed in Chinese and it's printed in English. And in that prayer request, or if you uh, have, you know, have attended prayer meeting, prayer meeting is done in English, but you get these prayer sheets. And on those prayer sheets, you have prayer requests from people from the entire church. So, so you get to see, you know, here's a Cantonese brother or sister, and, and they, they're struggling with cancer. You go pray for them. And, and they're praying for you. They're praying for the English brothers and sisters. So talk about... Uh, barriers of worship location and barriers of language it is the gospel of jesus christ that we share with one another that even if you can't go and communicate with them you can pray for them and you know that they can pray for you and that happens because we have unity in the spirit so that's how it applies number one personally to you the holy spirit will work in your life and when the holy spirit works in your life he will one overcome various boundaries that you think that he can't. But secondly, people will respond differently to the work of the Spirit in your life and how will you respond. But, as, but a second larger application is to the church is that the Holy Spirit allows us to overcome language barriers and location barriers even here 
And thirdly, I want to say again that uh, some of you responded last time and we ran all these books and there's more copies. Okay, so I have, I think I have like 65 more copies. Um, I ordered another case. So if you want this book, uh, I was saying a couple weeks ago that one of the ways we can prepare ourselves for the work of God, one of the ways we can prepare ourselves is that before we even have enough time or the right buildings to set up programs, if God brings unbelievers, seekers, or baby Christians into our church, we want you here. If you're a baby Christian, if you're a seeker, if you don't know anything about Jesus, we want you here. Yeah, we're not going to hold back. Yes, we're going to teach you the Bible, but we love you and we want to teach you the Bible, and we know it's God that's brought you here. Right now, if you're a new believer, uh, we may be able to turn you to someone, but we need more help. We need individuals to organically be ready. That, that if you see someone next to you and they're new, you can just ask them, oh, are you new? Are you visiting? Are you from another church? If they're not, if they're like, I'm here for the new time, introduce yourself. Can you, if they're a baby Christian, walk them through the basics of what it means to live the Christian life? What's the next step? If they're not a Christian and God has brought, brought them here, will you be able to, as a member of our church, just basically share the basic message of the gospel? And only if, only if they have a question that you absolutely cannot answer, then you can take it to a, you know, the pastors or deacons or Sunday school teachers. That way, all of us become vibrant members on Jesus' mission together. That's what it would mean to have a missional congregation, that you can walk into this church and into this congregation, and everyone's missional. Everyone's ready and able to share. So again, this is a basic, this doesn't have all the answers, but it's a basic six-week study, uh, and just get together with random uh, with, with a group of friends from church or, or get together, two or three of you, take your own pace in your own time. You promise to do this, I'll give this to you for free. You know, ask me for whatever you need. I, there's three of us. We need three copies. I'd love to put this in your hands because it's more valuable in your hands than in the warehouse of Nine Marks. We love Nine Marks. We want to take this off their, their, their warehouse shelf, put it into your hands so that you can be part of Jesus' mission. Okay, with that, let me pray. And if you like these books, I'm just going to set them down here and you can come up to get them um, at, you know, at any time uh, prior to the end of the service. Okay? Um, so let me pray for us. Will you bow with me, please? Father, we thank you so much for Acts chapter 2. And, and Lord, we thank you so much for the power of your Holy Spirit to overcome barriers in our lives and barriers to the gospel. And specifically in this context, language and location. But Lord, I pray that as we continue to study the book of Acts, that you would call more of us out, more of us out to follow you, to live for you, to be missional in what we do. Equip us, Lord, with a passion for your name, to proclaim it, change our lives, and prepare us to respond to how people might treat us differently. Because we know that when you work, it is your work, and you work in your sovereign timing. So will you work in our church, starting by working on the individual members? In all hearts, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.